Hello everyone and welcome to this another episode of GDDV 100 Game Theory 1. My name is Kasanis. We are moving along pretty darn well here, guys. This would be week five. We've entered into week five of this particular course. If you were taking this course in with me in school, we'd be on week five. So far, we've covered a heck of a lot of stuff. We've covered what is game. We've talked about design thinking, different methodologies involved in game design. We've talked about the idea of flow states and immersion and how we can personally, as developers and designers, affect immersion of our players. We went through an entire section on narrative and why it's important. And again, I want to stress here, narrative is important uh, as far as MDA is concerned. We'll go back to MDA, uh, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. And one of the aesthetic aesthetics is narrative, right? You need that driving force in particular games in order to keep your players immersed. Today, we're going to talk about character. That's where we're going to start today. We're going to start with character, and we're going to start off with an introduction to character. All right, everyone, let's get started. Character. So why do we care? This is another question. I asked you this about narrative. Why do we care about narrative? Why do we care about character and what does it mean? Some games have, uh, have very intense characters that are available to the player to interact with and others have characters that are completely faceless. So why do we care? Well, a lot of research has come forward and shown that, that people remember characters. In fact, if you ask someone about a, about a particular story that they remember or, or uh, a particular game they remember, they will often describe the character involved in that game to you, depending, of course, on what type of game you're creating. But a lot of times, the, the people who have gone through those story moments or have gone through those, those games will describe the character. So having an interesting set of characters uh, for your player to interact with or to play is going to be a, an awesome way of, of ensuring that your players remain immersed or that they remember your game. <laughs> Right, uh, a lot of research have showed us that people remember story and gameplay that are associated with particular characters. If I say to you Assassin's Creed, well, there's a particular character that comes to mind. Right, you remember that particular character, uh, and of course, you don't remember every single time that that assassin assassinated someone, or uh, you may remember very particular events that occurred, particularly um, fantastic assassinations that you completed, but you think about it in terms of that particular character. So it's important for us to think about character as we're designing our games. It's also come through studies that in some cases, a poorly designed character, a poorly thought through character, uh, can lead to a, a lessening of immersion or a negative effect on player immersion, right? If there's something that's incongruent with the way that, that the player thinks that character should behave or the way a character acts or the way a character moves, all of these things are noticeable by the player. And as soon as they're noticing things like that, they're no longer immersed in your game. Instead, they're looking at the production of your game. They're thinking about the production of your game, and that's not what you want. You don't want people to be lost in the production of your game. You want them to be playing your game and becoming immersed within your game so we can steal all of their time. <laughs> I know I keep saying that, uh, and it's, it's something that I keep thinking about. You know, that, that's what we do. That's what we do. We give people enjoyment, yes, uh, but we are, we're actively trying to take their time. <laughs> anyway, guys, let's go on with character. Stephen King, I think the best stories always end up being about the people rather than the event, which is to say a character-driven story. So what are the different types of characters that are involved in a story? Well, the protagonist, and there's more than just this, obviously. Uh, the protagonist is the central character in the conflict. It is, the, it is the, the character that the story is typically following. That's the protagonist. And standing in the protagonist's way is an array of forces. It could be another character. It could be a, a person of some kind. It could be the environment. It could be culture. We already talked about the idea of conflict and the different types of conflict uh, that are available within a story. Any of these forces that are arrayed against the, against the protagonist is called the antagonist. All right, based on whatever conflict, as we discussed before, person versus person, person versus nature, person versus society, person versus self, right? Depending on who is arrayed against uh, the protagonist, that is the antagonist. In a lot of traditional films and movies and, and uh, literature, uh, there is this real need to have a, 
a character-driven story. The stories themselves are about characters, and the plot is then formed around that character, right? That character might be involved, yes, in events. Obviously, they will be involved in events and that kind of thing, but the stories themselves are really about the characters. These are story-driven uh, or character-driven uh, stories as opposed to a plot-driven story. In video games, lots of people still consider this to be very important. It's not important in all cases, but if we go back to the idea of mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics, there are several different aesthetics that are directly related to the idea of, of character, right? Uh, the entire idea of an aesthetic of narrative, where the players are looking to complete and, and unravel a story as it unfolds in front of them. That's what they're looking for. Or the entire aesthetic of fantasy, where we have the chance to be somebody else, right? Both of these aesthetics are related directly to character and how our character in our game is involved uh, or, or how the story itself revolves around that particular character. So when you start to consider the games you're making, make sure you are considering those aesthetics. We talked about that in, in a far distant episode now. It's important to consider the aesthetics that you want within your games. Why are your players playing the games? If it's about character, narrative or fantasy, then you're going to want to make sure that you've got strong characters within your game. There was also some suggestion previously when we, had, when we talked about the idea of immersion that strong characters and uh, strong uh, narrative uh, can have a direct effect on uh, immersion levels of your player. In fact, uh, immersion levels can be affected by a player uh, by a player coming back to an original location or some type of reoccurring character. All of these things are going if, if the characters are fun <laughs> and the area is fun, all of these things can have a direct positive effect on the immersion level of your player. Again, that's what we want to do, keep our player immersed. So what does that mean then? Does that mean that every single story and every single game, do they all have to revolve around the idea of character? Is that what I'm suggesting here? Well, no, it's not necessarily what I'm suggesting. Obviously, depending on the type of game and the particular aesthetics that you've chosen, uh, character may play a more or less important role in your particular game. There are lots of games that have silent or faceless protagonists, right? We project ourselves typically when we're given a, an avatar of some kind within a game uh, without a personality assigned to it. We often project ourselves onto that character, right? We, If we're given moral choice within a game or, or player choice within a game, we often make the choices that we would make as a person uh, rather than as that particular character, right? We, we think that, well, this is what I would do, and we make our decisions based on that. So there are lots of games that have a faceless, silent protagonist of some kind, but we often project our own character, our own being onto these particular uh, assets within the game itself. And not every time is there a, is, does it require a driving force, a character driving force within your game. There are a lot of other games, especially if we have a silent or faceless protagonist, where the events themselves are what's driving your game forward. Then this reflects more on narrative than it does on the character itself. The, the, the narrative is occurring around this character, this faceless character in which, in which we are controlling. Uh, and there's a lot of times when, when it's important that the genre itself or the environment itself is of extreme importance in order for your game to make sense. Uh, some genres have more or less impact on, on the amount of need there is for character. So uh, obviously, and, and when I'm talking about genres, I'm not only talking about narrative genres, but uh, game genres as well. Uh, game aesthetics will define whether or not you require more and more characters. Uh, so, yeah, th that's the case. You're going to have to decide in, in creating your characters in your game exactly how much character you need and how thoroughly to design the character, whether I'm talking about the avatar or other characters within the game. Which brings us to the idea of two different types of characters that we might encounter within any given game. An NPC or a non-player character and a PC or a player character. So let's start off with the idea of NPCs. What exactly are NPCs? Well, I've already mentioned it's a non-player character. And as that name implies, it is a character that is not in some way controlled by the player. <laughs> that should be pretty obvious. We've already talked a little bit about the idea uh, of the creation of NPCs and what they would be for. So in adding NPCs to the world or the game which you're creating, it's going to add life to the world itself in the game. Uh, an empty, if you've created yourself a city and there's no no characters in it, no NPCs in it, that's going to tell a very different story than if you have a city that's full of people that are walking around, right? One will feel lifeless and empty, whereas the other one will feel vibrant and full. Depending on the type of game you're playing, you're going to want to choose <laughs> somewhere along that spectrum of either lifeless all the way through to, to full, but it's going to be up to you. 
Uh, typically, an NPC is a non-interactive asset that really brings complexity to the world that you've created, right? It, it adds detail and realism to the world that you've created. Uh, it also could be interactive assets of some kind that allow you to deliver narrative points or allow you to deliver quests or things like that. And depending on the type you've chosen while you're adding this particular NPC, it's going to require a, a different amount of work to add that particular NPC. One uh, can be a simple character that's maybe walking around or has a couple of, of particular animations associated with it or a couple of particular interactions associated with it. And the other may require an intense uh, dialogue tree, uh, some type of, of intelligence associated with it, that kind of thing. So adding, depending on the type of NPC you've add, it's going to require a differing amount of work. And it's going to be very important for you to decide why you're adding these NPCs. You have to very carefully consider the amount of work that's going to be done. If you are going to add in thousands of NPCs and you're going to be adding in individual lore and histories and backgrounds and what have you for each of these NPCs, different interactions and, and different cultures as we discussed already within, within the, the world building episodes, if you're going to add all of this kind of stuff, it's going to require a ton of different work. Right? There's going to be a lot of work associated with adding in all of these individual characters. However, on the other side of things, if you've just simply got a world where everyone's walking around zombie-like and with the, you know, the exact same animations and the exact same, uh, the exact same lines of dialogue that are be thro being thrown out, this repetitive nature of the world you've created through your NPCs is going to become noticeable to your player. And once it becomes noticeable to your player, it's going to have a negative effect on the player's immersion. They are going to be noticing the production of your game and not actually playing your game, right? So there's going to be a, a very careful balance that needs to go into the creation of your NPCs. Understand why you're adding those NPCs. Understand it, Understand how you think your players are going to interact or, or behave or you know see these NPCs and once you understand these details you're going to be able to then go in and add the appropriate amount of information uh, to that particular asset. So there's a lot of things that are going to affect the design of your NPCs. It's important that your NPCs fit into the world you've created uh, and we talked about this already so understanding the culture, understanding the different uh, areas of your world that you've created are going to define how an NPC looks, right? You want that NPC to be congruent with the world in which they exist. If someone looks at a particular NPC and they, they look or act or, or feel different than the world in which they are involved in, then once again, your players are noticing the production of your game and they're not actually playing your game. It has a negative effect on immersion. So even if you've got a character that is meant to be out of place, those particular characters are still going to be affected in some way by the world in which they have come from. So even if this world is outside of the scope of your game and you've simply added an additional character, it's going to be very important to understand where that character came from so that any other characters they, they meet within your game, any other characters your player meets within the game from that same world are going to be similar in nature. All right, guys, let's take a look at the idea of player characters. And again, player characters are interesting and a little bit different. Depending on, on the type of game you are making, it's going to mean a different thing. So a player character is really any character in which the player takes control. If the player is controlling that particular character, it is a player character. And we've already talked about this. The player character is the avatar of the player itself, the player who's playing the game. You may have a fully fleshed out player character or PC. Uh, it might be fully detailed and you are telling the story about that particular character. Uh, that's an interesting way of doing things. And again, depending on the aesthetic, the game aesthetic that you've chosen, that might be a, an important way of doing things. If the player is playing that particular game to understand the unfolding story of that player character, so if they are playing, if the aesthetic is narrative as an example, you're going to want to have a fully fleshed out PC and understand the, the understanding of that character, right? And, and why they behave a certain way. Other times, you're going to have a completely faceless PC, right? And in those particular cases, we're going to project our own self onto that particular player character. In doing so, it's going to be important that we are able to project ourselves properly uh, and to give someone an appropriate avatar that allows them to project themselves appropriately. In the past, a lot of games simply focused on, uh, you know, big, beefy, 
uh, male characters that are associated with you know fighting games and that kind of thing. In those particular cases, if you have people of other genders or, or, or what have you, other cultures, uh, they are kind of forced, if they see that particular character, they're kind of forced to uh, reject their own personalities. They can't actually project themselves onto those particular characters. So it's going to be very, very important in understanding your camera mechanics and creating yourself a faceless PC. Does one have an effect on immersion over the other? I'm not so sure, depending on the type of game that you're creating, right? If you are allowed to project yourself onto a particular avatar, onto a particular PC, uh, then you may become more immersed as you make decisions that you personally would make and you think of that, that avatar as yourself. You may become more immersed, right? But if you are not permitted for some reason, you've seen this character and they're like, oh my God, it's not me, and, and you're no longer able to accept the fact that you're no longer able to project your own self onto that particular character, it may have negative effects on immersion. So these are things that we actually have to consider as we're moving forward. So with that said, is there a benefit to a faceless PC over a silent PC, or a silent play character? And again, it all depends on, on the type of game that you are creating and the type of aesthetic for your game that you're, you're trying to create for your player. If the player is, a, if it's a narrative-based story, then maybe the player wants to see a fully fleshed out PC. If it's not a narrative-based game, you may want to have a silent PC. You may want to allow the players to project themselves onto that and feel like they are that person. If your goal is, for example, fantasy, if your aesthetic is fantasy, then that player may want to project themselves onto that particular player character. So understanding your game, I'm <laughs> going back, I hopefully you guys can see how all of this stuff is starting to tie together now. All of it's kind of coming together. We have to understand our gameplay through our core mechanics. We have to understand the experience we want to give our players through things like uh, MDA, through our, through our game aesthetics. And understanding that is going to define the game that you're going to be creating. Once you understand the game you're going to be creating, and building the world around that particular game and, and, and adding context to your game is going to allow your, your player to become more immersed and it's going to drive home that particular player aesthetic, game aesthetic that you, you're hoping to bring out within your player. And finally, the character that you are providing for your player is again going to emphasize that, that game aesthetic and that's what you want because all of that leads to immersion. I hope you guys can see how all of these, all these different lessons are kind of coming together. Hopefully you guys can see that. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about the player character and what it means to have a faceless PC uh, as, opposed to a, a, uh, as opposed to a fully fleshed out PC. If you're playing a character that the player cannot relate to in some way, this may cause an issue with immersion, right? The players want to be able to relate to the avatar that they're playing within the world that you've created. And if they can't do so, they're going to have a more difficult time becoming immersed within that. A lack of representation within a game can cause some issues, as I've already mentioned. If you have a particular fleshed out character uh, it's going to be much more difficult for someone who's not like that fleshed out character or can't imagine themselves being like that fleshed out character or can't put aside their own personality to play that fleshed out character to be able to enjoy your game, right? To be able to become immersed within your game. Having more representation in your game obviously causes or is re it requires a lot more work. Uh, in order to be able to do that. But having that representation within games is going to allow people to relate better to that particular character. When we have ourselves a faceless character, we make particular assumptions. And those assumptions allow us many times to project ourselves onto that character. It's interesting because we can go back in time to... Uh, to some of the different games where characters were revealed for the first time. So in cinematography, we talk about the idea of mechanics and, and, and camera mechanics and, and mechanics available within games. And in Portal, where the, where the character was permitted to create two portals and see themselves for the first time, um, and it was revealed that this character was a, a female. Uh, that the, you were actually playing a female. Uh, this uh, originally caused a little bit of an uproar <laughs> within the community, like, oh my god, I'm playing a woman. and and. Strangely, it didn't affect some people and it greatly affected others. So you make certain assumptions about this faceless character if you've added it, and then if you give your player an opportunity to see that faceless character, it can, it can destroy the assumptions they've made, and that in turn is going to uh, cause a, a, an issue with immersion.
Uh, and again, as I've already mentioned many times, that a silent protagonist is meant to allow us to pretend that we are that character, which is great for games, fantasy-based aesthetics, uh, as an example. We can pretend that we are that particular character. So uh, you have to be careful if you are allowing your, your player to project themselves onto a faceless character that they are able to do so uh, without breaking that, that immersive level. This is from Donald Miller. A story is a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. And we've already talked about the idea of what narrative it is. We talked about the idea of a three-sentence story or a one-sentence story where we introduce a character and we introduce the conflict and what's in their way and then we introduce a resolution. So that's basically what a story is. It involves a character, whether it's a faceless character or a fully fleshed out character, it involves a character of some kind. Like I said, this quote is very similar to our definition of game as well. Not just story, but our definition of game. Character plus want plus objective equals story. Want plus objective equals conflict. And we talk about game. Player plus want plus objective equals game. And that's that's true, right? We've already talked about the idea that uh, your game involves conflict, uh, an objective you're trying to, to complete, and in completing that objective, you come to a particular resolution. That sounds like story, doesn't it? Adding in the player in there, player is the one who's actually going ahead and completing all these different things. When we talk about the idea of, of character and story, understanding the underlying context or even be given, given the underlying context goes a long way in allowing the player to create the story. If I show you these two photos of a duck, in one case, it's very easy to understand what the conflict and what the story is. In another case, without any context at all, it's much more difficult. So placing your player within the world that you've created, placing your player uh, in, in a situation where there is conflict is going to drive the story or the underlying context of your game home. When we start to talk about creating a character, for some of us it might be more difficult than for others. Uh, there's a lot of different techniques that you could use in order to create a character. And if we were actually in class, we might go through several improv techniques uh, that I use in order to create characters, to fully fleshed out characters. But there's some things you can do, obviously, that <laughs> don't involve improv, obviously, as well. Understanding your character's desires will go a long way in helping you fill out who that character is. Of course, understanding where they came from, their history, understanding the, the cultural background and that kind of thing that you've created within your world is going to help you design that character, both visually and emotionally, uh, as far as the narrative is concerned. Uh, but there's certain things you can ask yourself that might help you create a, a fully fleshed out character. Understanding what drives your character and understanding uh, their innermost desires is going to take you a long way in understanding that particular character. So, a couple of questions you can ask yourself. What does this character want more than anything else in the world? And that's called the character's spine. It's referred to as the character's spine. And there's something keeping them from getting that. What is it that's keeping them from getting that thing? We already talked about in the narrative videos the idea of the one sentence story. And that one sentence story introduced a character, said this blank wants blank, but blank, right? And those blanks are who the character is, what they want, and what's stopping them from getting that. And once they have, once you understand those things, that's going to tell you a lot about your particular character. What are they willing to do to get? those things that they want or need. How far are they willing to go? Understanding that is going to define the limits of your character as well. Something else you can ask yourself is what is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to this particular character? And then do that to them. If you do that, and obviously in your imagination, if you do that to them, how do they react? And what do they do? And if you understand these things, it's going to tell you a lot about the, the psyche of your particular character. And that goes a long way in defining who this character is. It's just as important as things uh, like where they came from, the culture they belong to, and everything else that you've created within your world. So understanding these innermost desires uh, as early as possible is going to help you define exactly who that character is. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, let me know down below with a thumbs up. If you didn't, a thumbs down is perfectly fine. If you've got comments, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. I really enjoy reading your comments. All right, everyone, thumbs up, thumbs down, comments down below, and if you haven't done so, please take a few seconds to subscribe. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everyone.